I'm Rod Chappell and welcome to the Rod Chappell Show. Thanks for joining us. We like to bring issues that affect everyday people that may be legal in nature or have some legal consequence and bring them for further consideration. Today we're honored with a special guest, Representative Stephen Roberts. He is a leader in the House of Representatives in the state of Missouri and a very, very bright person. I'm very thankful that you're here with us. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Well, why don't you tell our, our viewers uh, about yourself? What led sure. you to service? Sure. Well, born and raised in the city of St. Louis. I uh, grew up there my whole life until I went away for college and then law school. I actually worked in the city as a prosecutor before I ran for office. I was on a felony armed defender unit. We were prosecuting gun crimes in St. Louis City. And while I ran for office, one of the most troubling issues I kept running into there was that seeing young men like myself really on the back end, mm -hmm. unable to really make as much of an impact on their life as I would have liked to. Mm -hmm. And I felt I could make a bigger difference on the policy side of things and pushing criminal justice reform matters. So uh, there's a seat that opened up uh, where I lived and I ran and I won. Wow, wow. And now I understand that you, you're a lawyer, of course. Correct. Uh, but you don't have to be a lawyer to work in the legislature, do you? Right. Right. Does it help, though? Oh, absolutely. I'd say my law degree, for, it gives you credibility, and it's been one of the most useful tools I've got. Because mm -hmm. you're actually drafting laws, right? Right, right. So if you've applied the laws, like as a prosecutor, it may be helpful if you understand the actual implications of writing this word versus that word in that place. Sure. It can also be kind of one of the more... Uh, frustrating things, especially when you come up with things that you know are constitutional, unconstitutional. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, I, I noticed one of our, our House research staff, so they kind of, if a re representative has an idea, they'll draft the piece of leg legislation for us, mm -hmm. whether it's unconstitutional or not. They kind of have to do what the representative says. Mm -hmm. And they had one of those signs on their door um, that said, you know, those ones that say like, you know, X amount of days since last uh, work-related injury, they oh. crossed out the work and put unconstitutional bill as passed the house. Ah. So uh, that can be a little frustrating <laughs> at times, but it definitely helps. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I get it. And I guess right across the street is the Supreme Court. So right. <laughs> you spit one out and just wait a few months and let it get Right, yeah. see that one over there in two years, right? <laughs> Man. Well, and now even in the House, the House of Representatives, you have a leadership role there? Yeah, I serve as the chairman of the Legislative Black Caucus, so that's for our House and Senate. And, and what is that? What, what does the chairman do? Sure. So really, it just kind of my focus is helping our legislators, our caucus members um, reach their goals. So right now, we've got a historic level of representation in the, the House. Um, there's seven leadership positions, and right now, five of those seven leadership positions are filled with members of the Black Caucus. Wow. Okay. And does that uh, does that mean that uh, it's well, what what? What's the effect of that? Does that let more legislation come out or let a, a more full discussion of issues occur? Absolutely. I think it allows us to more so steer the narrative and maintain what's important and those issues affecting really all Missourians, but in particular issues that have historically affected the black community. And I've got to say one of the most rewarding things I'm finding, I'm going into my third year now mm -hmm. um, in my second term, that there's an appetite on both sides of the aisle as far as criminal justice reform. This whole lock everyone away, mass incarceration model isn't working, we need to do something different. Well, and that's good, that's good. That's what some of the issues we've addressed either on this show or me and my practice, uh, and certainly through the NAACP, uh, we've seen some of those issues come up. So. Absolutely. Well, one of, well, tell us about it. Tell us, and, and I know that uh, for our viewership, there's a, a, a one-page uh, sheet that you've put together that allow people to actually see all the pieces of legislation from the Black Caucus or that are supported by members of the Black Caucus. Absolutely. Uh, that's at www.monaacp.org. And so if anybody wants to see that, that's a great place to go see it. Uh, and then we may be showing excerpts of that during the show. But tell us, tell us what a, what's, a, if you had to name the top three, what do you think those would be, right? Oh, man. It did to be, depending on the legislator, but I'd say the more general themes would be, you know, mm -hmm. um, criminal justice reform, voter empowerment, and women's rights. I mean, we've got some, um, some legislation that would allow early voting um, in our state, mm -hmm. uh, no excuse absentee voting. Uh, we've seen that kind of be the, the, the trend across the country and there's no reason or excuse that Missouri shouldn't follow uh, in that way. Uh, we actually uh, got uh, two of those bills, one carried by um, Representative Ashley. She's actually the vice chair of the caucus, Bland Manlove out of Kansas City, is doing a great job. And uh, Representative Wiley Price um, from St. Louis City, he's got one as well. The, um, both of those have made it out of committee. We're hoping to bring them up to the House floor. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. That is excellent. Are those the first, is this the first year that those have come out of committee uh, that, that you can remember? 
Definitely within the last since I've been there. Yeah. I haven't seen it make it this far. So yeah. we've really been pushing that really hard. And you know, a lot of people uh, on both sides of the aisle see the, the value of it. I mean, we want to encourage people to vote. It's important. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. And then uh, tell me about the criminal justice reform that we're working on. Sure. So um, one of the bills, I filed a version and Carla Mays got one in the House. Um, and there's uh, another representative who's actually the budget chair, Cody Smith, that he's carrying. Um, and we were able to get that one out of the House. What it does is it um, eliminates mandatory minimums for some offenses. And really what we're aiming at is taking a situation where you've got a nonviolent offender or some of these you know, low-level drug offenses, as mm -hmm. we've seen with Amendment 2. Right. It's shown that you know, Missouri's viewpoint, our citizens have changed towards some of these drug cases. Yes. And what this bill does is it lowers the floor not the ceiling on um, these types of offenses. So it'll allow a judge to use discretion. So as opposed to, you know, by our current statute, someone might, because of a prior offense, be required to serve 85% of the time. Mm -hmm. It's completely taken out of their discretion. This would lower that. So look, I mean, if it's something bad, they still have the ability to give them the max sentence. But if, you know, it's someone with a, a marijuana or a drug case and the judge is saying, look, this guy doesn't need to go away for three years for that. Absolutely. They're able to use that discretion. Is this where we see some of those stories out of the headlines where, you know, Lady Steals Twinkie gets life? You <laughs> right. know what I mean? There's three strikes and you're out thing or Absolutely. something like that. Okay. Well, and just not far off from that, um, regarding these, um, what they call board bills, where a woman, I believe, mm -hmm. she stole like a tube of mascara, um, spent a weekend in jail, then there was a warrant out for arrest. She ended up sitting for like six months and she got billed for her stay there. So it's just thousands of dollars that you know she's never going to pay and, you know, being in contempt and just. Finally, the Supreme Court has ruled that those are unconstitutional, but we're able to get that piece of legislation out of the House as well. Wow. Wow. Now, how does that one look? Do you think that one's going to pass? I think so. Okay. I do. Um, and it's kind of funny. Um, uh, a representative who's a friend, but I consistently find myself on opposite sides on a lot of these <laughs> legal issues. Right. <laughs> you know? We respectfully disagree with each other, but him and uh, another colleague, uh, Representative Ella Brock, they're both, he, uh, Representative DeGroat's a Republican, Ella Brock's the, the Democrat, they're both carrying it together. And they're kind of marking me uh, end up on the same issue side of a lot of these. So it's just mm -hmm. funny. They're kind of like this dynamic duo on this one issue right here, <laughs> where they disagree with basically everything else on the face of the planet. Hey, well, that's probably one of the few bills that, you know, has got to go. Right. right? Yeah. 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 That's it's good. It's just it's the right thing to do. And, um, you know, we had a very strong support in the committee and mm -hmm. the floor. So it's, you know, I, looking at the, the news headlines, it seems like we're always at each other's throats. But, you know, I will say I think there's more legislation we agree upon than don't agree upon. Wow. That's excellent. That's excellent. D is there any kind of a retroactivity uh, with the board bill? bill? I mean, so for folks who've already been through the system, to do something with them, or do you think people just look at the law and then? You know, I, I can't remember off the top of my head. Okay, yeah. okay. Well, we'll, we'll have a, a look at that one. Absolutely. Uh, and then I think that the, another area that you mentioned was, was it women empowerment? Absolutely, okay. well, the women's rights, so in particular, I'm thinking okay. of, a, of a shackling. I mean, you hear those horror uh, stories of, you know, women who are, you know, going through pregnancy being detained. And yeah, yeah, and, and so I think I understand this one. This is where you have a lady who's incarcerated, she happens to be pregnant, uh, well, and I understand that some of them become pregnant while they're there. Right. <laughs> but uh, they've been shackled while they're giving birth. Absolutely. Under some arcane notion that they're going to deliver a baby and then run away or something? Yeah. It's crazy. But Wow. That's just incredible. And so you, you, there's a bill currently pending to... Absolutely. That one's made it out of committee and then also one dealing with... Um, uh, women's like hygiene products, things like that, mm -hmm. that they would need in, in prison as well, making those available. So both of those have um, made it out and you know, hopefully we'll get them across the finish line. Yeah, and so right now, I guess with the, the hygiene products for women, they have to buy those themselves? Right. right. That's something, isn't it? Yeah. That is something. Okay, okay. So you, and you think that those may go as well? I do. All right, all right. What, uh, what else should we be watching for? What else is your room? Your, well, something I've always been really passionate about, just kind of from the things um, I've experienced in my life, um, cash bail reform. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's absurd that, you know, the way the systems work is, you know, you need to look at is this person a threat to society? Are they a danger to a victim? Are they unlikely to return back to court? You know, I've seen as my time as a prosecutor, people who were held who, at, who shouldn't have been just because they were poor and couldn't pay the bill that was set. And it might be an amount that, you know, to you or me was, fine, you know, we get, but, you know, this person just couldn't make it, and then they're sitting there. And then, you know, if this person has a family, or let's say they do have a job, I mean, how many days of work can you really miss before you're fired? Right. 
Right. Well, you know, as a small business owner, one. Right. That's it. That's it. Yeah. And all the cascading negative effects that fall from that. You know, there's a gentleman in, in our own community here in Jefferson City. Got arrested on some minor charge, didn't have enough money to make bail, lost his house, lost his car, lost his job, you know, uh, had a number of family members that were staying with him, but of course when he lost his housing, so did they. Right. And so that really just scattered a lot of people into the wind over something that at best was a public nuisance, but in his situation what is it, didn't even amount to that, you know. That's so, horrible. That's good. You, and you think that that's got some legs to it? You think that'll? That one's a little tougher. So okay. recently, uh, I guess the uh, bail bondsman found out about it. Oh. So I've <laughs> been getting a lot of hate mail towards that. But there's <laughs> another rep, Roberts, who serves on the committee. And he was teasing me the other day because some of them are confusing me with him. So he's getting all the emails from this organization. <laughs> Tell him to keep it up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got enough email, especially the bad ones. Right. Wow. Okay. Well, and so there are industries that are actually behind the Absolutely. bell work. So, gotcha. Gotcha. Well, you know, and it's important to have good bells people, and I've certainly worked with folks, like when the Poor People's Campaign came to mm -hmm. town, uh, we were all set up to deal with those folks and actually engage the services of some people uh, to ensure that we didn't have people that were sitting in jail, right. necessarily. Right. But at the same time, uh, I think that you got to make sure that you don't have people that are sitting in jail unnecessarily. Absolutely. So. All right. Well, what, what else do you have? You got any, another piece that you would suggest for us to keep it? Oh, definitely. And okay. this one, um, it's, I think there's a chance I'm trying to shape, turn it into an amendment to finance something because we're in our final um, three weeks. And what it does is it's a tax incentive for employers to hire um, ex-felons. So if they take someone on full time, um, they would get a deduction of up to $5,000. Um, and then it's capped as well. So, you know, they're there's not going to be a high fiscal note on it, but really the focus is to put together, at least what I would like to do, kind of a suite of information mm -hmm. to give to these people who deserve a second chance, that ability that, you know, an employer might not necessarily take them on. Yeah. Because, I mean, as you could imagine, if you've got two great candidates and one has a felony conviction and one doesn't, right. why take the risk? That's you right. Know? So just trying to think of positive ways to... to incentivize employers to kind of give these people a second chance who've earned it. I mean, mm -hmm. I got to say, when I was canvassing last summer, I ran into a lot of people who were convicted felons, you know, pay their debts to society, but weren't welcome back in after. Wow. Well, well and I think that's huge. You know, I've been a proponent of reentry programs, and so uh, providing an incentive to employers, that'll be huge. That'll Absolutely. be huge, because if somebody knows that uh, even as a, some of the landlords have complained that they're saying, oh, I can't, I don't know about this person because they just got out. They've got no history you right, know, in, right. in the private sector. Um, if you know that a person can get a job or is likely to have a job, and we've got historically low unemployment, mm -hmm. um, I don't, so there's no reason someone can't go to work, uh, and providing a better incentive to allow that person to do that Absolutely. Seems, seems important. Okay. All right. And yes, there's some other kind of arcane laws where we're trying to fix that I think have a chance of making it across this line. Um, there's one where you're, if you've got a felony conviction, you're not allowed to like sell uh, liquor or um, lottery tickets, things like that. So, you know, I mean, this is a job that anyone can do. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But to say, well, you know, imagine you're at a gas station or somewhere like that, just trying to kind of get an entry level position to earn a living, right. not being able to do that. I mean, if you're a manager, you've, you've got to factor that in. Like if you know, all right, well, this employee can't handle this aspect of it. They're almost become a burden of it because then you have to have another person on duty as well who can do that specific thing. And this, um, that bill is actually carried by a Republican. Um, okay. So I, I think that that one has a, a shot as well. It, it sounds like you work uh, pretty well across the aisles. Absolutely. I mean, you've got yeah. to, especially in this state, you've got a super Republican majority mm -hmm. here in Missouri. You know, there's, um, what, 47 uh, Dems in the House, about 114 Republicans. Uh -huh. um, so. It's, uh, we're outnumbered about three to one, so it can be tough sometimes. Absolutely. And, and from your perspective, you've been there a while. Do you, do you see some issues that are urban and rural all at the same time? Absolutely. Um, I would say one, um, uh, the, the opioid epidemic and crisis, uh, it's reaching across mm -hmm. all areas. So, you know, unfortunately, you know, when it was affecting my community, the whole crack versus cocaine, how those cases were prosecuted, as yeah. I'm sure you're very familiar with, Absolutely. you know, you know, these are bad people that need to be convicted to now it's, well, no, this is really, you know, a, a treatment issue. We've got it, which is the right response to these situations. Right. But now that it's affecting communities across the board, there's a strong movement. That's good. To treat it that way. That's good. That's good. You know, uh, so, okay. So we've, we've, we've picked out some bills that we need to support. You have any that we need to kill? Oh, <laughs> um, yeah, there's a, uh, it's called the, it's a fetal uh, heartbeat bill, and we're, it basically would make the, the 
harshest um, uh, abortion regulations um, in the state. It, um, it's it's clear violation of Roe v. Wade. I think it's unconstitutional. I'm hoping oh. that it'll die in the Senate, but it did make it out of the House. Wow. Okay. Okay. And that's just an example of uh, some folks who may be motivated by whatever whatever's moving them, but at the same time not doing it within the law. Right. Which is probably not the right thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All right. And um, ha any others? Some of this tort reform, I think, is uh, is is going to be. Um, harmful. I mean, it's very good for, you know, the, the defense industry, but, you know, for the everyday constituents mm -hmm. that we represent, it's bad for them. It's yeah. bad for the little guy, you know, the, yeah. the joint of venue stuff, mm -hmm. um, you know, trying to, you know, not allow, you know, what, 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 you know, we may not be able to take on as a case because it's such a small amount, unless you're able to kind of group a group of people, uh, a class of people together to mm -hmm. make it worth the while, you know, someone could be doing something bad and just continue to get away with it because no one will take it up. Right, right. And, it, and it's funny uh, that you look at some issues which you can look at it and see something's clearly wrong. Absolutely. But then from a different standpoint, if some of the reforms that people are trying to enact, some of the limitations on the ability of people, just citizens, to protect themselves using the courts, right. or if those are going into place, there, there may not be a real opportunity for right. them to do that. Right. Right. And even though they're lawyers, whether it's you, me, or any of the other lawyers around the state who'd be willing to take on someone's cause, you still have to be able to do that and do it in a way that is within the law and uh, that is not so cumbersome that you can't do it within your practice. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Boy, when, when people say joinder, I think a joinder, and I, I like joining. I, I joined Rotary. I joined uh, NAACP. I joined a bunch of groups. Is that what we're talking about with the joinder stuff? Is that what's happening? A, a little, little different. Than oh, okay. Right, All right. right, right. <laughs> you know, you're, you're selecting the, the venue you want to be in, um, you know, because you want to make it fair to the, the victim as well as the um, respondent on the other side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it just needs to be. And, uh, I don't see what's so fair about the rules we have now. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It seems like uh, a lot of ideas going about. And I remember when I was in state government, and this has been a little while ago, but one of the ideas is that we had so many regulations, you know, and I know that's a very popular theme at the, leg at the legislature right now. Mm -hmm. Let's have less regulation. Right. Right. Uh, but here they want to they want to have some more. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this feels like somebody's saying it's okay to regulate us. But uh, that we should have to deal with that now. Yeah, now. right. Right, right. Well, I hope that that doesn't go forward. Um, any other issues? Yeah, so there's one we actually were just debating this week, and it was dealing with um, uh, mechanical contract workers. So basically the way it would work is right now, like let's say you want to, um, you know, and mechanical workers is such a, a it could be like from working in a, a nuclear reactor to, I mean, I'm not a, a tradesman, but it's that mm -hmm. kind of whole scope. And what it does is it's, yeah. what it's trying to do is make a uniform standard across the board, but you can have a person doing the work who isn't licensed. Mm -hmm. The way it works is that as long as the person who's supposed to be under them has the license, they're held accountable for it. But you could have a person doing this stuff who didn't have any of that formal training or doesn't actually hold the license. So okay. it's one of the things where I see what they're trying to do. They're trying to you know make it more streamlined across the board, but with these types of jobs, kind mm -hmm. of speaking with um, the unions and the trades workers, are saying, well, this goes too far because of the nature of the work. Uh -huh. You want these people regulated and you want them to make sure that they have the skill set because people can die. I mean, it's a situation where, um, and I'm not a tradesman, but sure. I remember um, in committee, there's a story about someone where, I guess, something to do with how they set up the, the heating in the house and carbon monoxide poisoning. They, they hooked the wrong thing in and people have died from wow. stuff like that. So it's serious stuff. That's terrible. And yeah. so this bill would actually allow people who don't have the qualifications to do the work under the idea that somebody else is going to look at it. Exactly. Right. So they're saying, well, that's the check and balance because if something goes wrong, well, the person will be held accountable who actually has it and could lose it. But it's like, well, the damage has been done and this could have been avoided. Uh -huh. so. uh -huh. Well, I mean, they do that in the medical profession all the time, right? right. They've got doctors and then, you know, they let the nurses just prescribe medicine. Will right, they, right. And then they come in and check off, right? Yeah, that's a great example. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Representative Beck used that as an example as well. He's like, so wait, so if you're going in for surgery, you're just going to let the guy who's operating, the, the operating doctor, like, you know, he's under his supervision uh -huh. kind of thing. Yeah, delegate. Yeah, right. you take this Yeah, one. you can do this. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, boy. Okay, so, and that's a prime example. You know, deregulating, or I guess, or including uh, folks in a different way that hadn't been, they want to expand the opportunity for something bad to happen there, 
But then when you look at the, the ability for people to use the court system to mm -hmm. defend themselves, they want to restrict our capacity to do it there. Right. That's tough. That's tough. You know, I still think about Senate Bill 43 and what a oh, debacle man. that is, uh, where you actually prevent people from bringing cases uh, into circuit court so that they can sue the person that harmed them. Right. Right. And that can be a physical harm. That can be a, a mental harm. It can be so many different ways. Um, but we did that. We got to make sure that doesn't happen again. Absolutely. Yeah. That was kind of one of my most disappointing um, experiences that I had being in the House, not being able to kind of stop that piece of legislation. Yeah. I mean, it's dealing with those cases, but also, you know, sex discrimination, right. harassment, everything across the board. You know, we've made Missouri one of the most difficult cases to prevail yeah. in the country. That's and that's right. not the way the conscience of our state should be moving. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. I think one day the people will catch up to the, to the, uh, the folks that were behind making that law. Yeah. And we'll get that all righted. I really do. Um, well, I know that uh, you've got to get back to the legislature. We're almost done with the session. Tell, tell me this. Why should regular folks care? We've talked about a number of pieces of legislation. What, what's the, why is this important to real people? That's a great question. Because this, you might not think it, but the decisions that are made in that building have ramifications to every person who lives in this state. I mean, what we do up there, like for example, you know, you, you want a higher minimum wage. The city of St. Louis, Kansas City, we raised our minimum wage. And what happened? The state legislature went and created a state level lowering that amount. So we weren't able to have that um, higher minimum wage. You know, that's another kind of example of hypocrisy. Well, we need less government. Well, here, the city of St. Louis says we want a higher minimum wage. Uh -huh. And the state government saying, we don't like that. I mean, if you think it's a bad idea, okay, let St. Louis fail. I mean, let us do what we want to do. Right. But, you know, they, they um, overrode the will of the people and created a statewide lower minimum wage and didn't allow us that, over, that overwrote the wage increase that St. Louis had passed. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that that's important where people need to know that. They need to come out and testify, as you have um, many times. You know, that makes a difference. When people are actually able to, to put a face to something as they're making... Um, these decisions. I mean, I can't tell you how many times on judiciary you hear kind of like heartbreaking testimony of things people have been through and to share that with the committee. It makes people think twice about what they're doing. Wow. Wow. Well, and that's important. That's important. We'll certainly encourage folks to, it's just the legislature, right? <laughs> I mean, I say just, the building's right there. It's hard to miss. It's one of the biggest in Jeff City. Yeah. Uh, it's easy to get here for, they got our, every road connects to Jeff City one right. way or another. Right. And uh, that's still the people's house, isn't it? It's the people's house. Yeah, yeah. Well, I sure appreciate you being here today. Oh, it's my pleasure. You know, uh, I know that you've got tons of responsibilities and lots of people counting on you. Sure. And so bringing the message to the people in Jefferson City, mid-Missouri, and maybe even around the state in this way, I hope, gets the word out. Yes, sir. All right. And if they're looking for a way to get in contact, I do a weekly yes. newsletter. Yes. Me and my assistant, we send it out every week. It talks about what's going on, what people need to be concerned about, aware of. If they shoot me an email, I can add them to it. Um, it's my name, Stephen, mm -hmm. S-T-E-V-E-N, dot Roberts, R-O-B-E-R-T-S, at house dot M-O dot gov. Shoot me an email, um, give me your information, just with your email address, um, I'll add you to it, and you can be informed about what's going on in Jeff City. Okay, let me make sure I got that right. Stephen dot Roberts at house dot M-O dot gov. You got it. And that's Stephen, S-T-E-V-E-N. Yes, sir. All right. All right. We'll see if we can get that on the, on the show. Well, thanks for joining us today. As you know, the legislative season is coming to an end, and we'll keep an eye out for those Christmas trees that are coming around where they attack on all kinds of amendments. Oh, yeah. We'll watch out for the bad bills that we've identified here on this program and try to bring some more to you if we can find them. But in the meantime, think about the good things that we talked about, the progress that Missouri could make if we passed just one or two pieces of legislation that we talked about now. People not being looked, locked up that shouldn't be there simply because they can't afford it. People being allowed to vote because they haven't been disenfranchised from the vote. And allowing people who are already incarcerated or in some situation that they did not totally control to have access to even basic hygiene needs such as women and making sure that they aren't shackled during childbirth. Let your voice be heard. Be active with your legislature. Talk to your legislative representatives, whether that's in the House or the Senate. Make sure that they know your name and what you stand for. Thanks for joining us on The Rod Chapel Show.